Blue Friday Horseshoe FAQ is back. That means myself and Matt Taylor are here in studio. I'm Lara Overton. He is the voice of the Colts. It is also Matt Taylor's birthday today. So if you thought there was not enough reason to celebrate already <laughs> with it being week one of the NFL season, Colts hosting the Seattle Seahawks. Now, one more reason to celebrate. This guy has an extra candle to blow out <laughs> on the cake back there today. So we are so one excited. One more trip around the sun. One more trip around the sun. We made it. What better way for <laughs> you as being someone who has been a lifelong Colts fan, you've grown up here, you get to celebrate your birthday weekend with the return of Colts football. So I'm talking Lucas about Stadium. nice shirt, by the way. That is on point right there. So I had to pay homage to my guy, Matt Taylor, wearing the touchdown <laughs> INDY shirt because we're going to hear that an awful lot. On That's Sunday. what I'm saying. That's the plan anyways. I've done like 30 radio interviews this week. I've been on all these talk shows. I'm tired of talking about it. Let's be about it, Lara. I mean, all, every offseason is really, really long, right? You go nine months between games, but I feel like this year especially Absolutely. was a very, very long offseason considering the hype surrounding this team, the continuity coming back, all the starters on both sides of the football, and just hype, expectations, and we talk all the time about those first five games of the season. It's a gauntlet for the Colts and playing all those playoff teams from 2020, plus trying to get off to a good start, which this franchise has not been 1-0 since 2013. It's, it's a very important game, and I'm just very, very excited to start it and get it going with uh, 65,000 of our closest friends at Lucas Oil. That is going to be a welcome sight, no, no doubt. doubt. I will be back on the sidelines joining our radio coverage with Matt Taylor, Rick Venturi, and then I'll be on the sidelines starting for that one o'clock kickoff at Lucas Oil Stadium. Submit your questions right here. We'll be sure to as at, we'll be sure to answer as many of those as we can over the course of the next uh, 10 minutes or so. We'll get through a lot of them. Uh, one note as we're getting into our conversation this morning, of course, the Colts have not practiced yet this Friday. That'll come at noon, uh, about a 12-15 practice today, if I remember yep. correctly. Yep. So uh, it's been a little bit all over the place this week, getting back into a new routine because now the Colts will have Tuesdays off. It used to be a Monday off, so they'll get in the building on Monday, Tuesday off, and then really get into the install for the week with those practices on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. The first question that we have here is from Nathan. He said, if Rhodes misses time, who do you see matching up with DK Metcalf? on Sunday. That's yeah. a, that is a massive challenge and it probably comes down to more than one person, right? Well, I think yes, I, I think you're exactly right and it will be very disappointing for the Colts if Xavier Rhodes can't play because he's one of the best corners in the game last year. He gave up only the second uh, highest completion percentage in the NFL last year to opposing quarterbacks at 51 percent. So when you're talking about all pro corners, I know he wasn't on that level last year, but he played like one considering, you know, he's up there with guys like Stephon Diggs or uh, Gilmore in, in New England, right? There's a really, really good cornerbacks. Um, so you're going to miss his availability out there if he's not going to be uh, uh, out there on Sunday, but it's going to be up to guys like Rock Yassim and TJ Carey and you got a player like Russell Wilson that can extend plays. He can get out of the pocket. He can make some things happen with that scrambling ability. And his two primary targets, they get it done in different ways, right? DK Metcalf, six foot four, 230. He's a huge yards per catch guy. He leads the NFL in 25 yard receptions since breaking into the NFL in 2019. And then Tyler Lockett gets it done a different way. He's five foot 10, a buck 80, but both guys are speed merchants. So, to me, it's not a it's not a if it's when a guy like Rocky Seen gets lined up on DK Metcalf when they go three wide receivers. There's no question in my mind they're going to line him up all by himself, Metcalf that is in the boundary, and it's going to be a one on one matchup between he and Rocky Seen, who's you know much smaller in terms of height, but he has to play big and and win some of those one on one matchups. And I mean, listen, uh, we all know Rocky Seen the last couple of years, and he's talked about this. He's he's admitted to needing to smooth out his career. He's had some bumps in the road along the way, but no better way to get it started by getting a lot of playing time right out of the gate in week one and go up against one of the best pure, you know, big bodied receivers in the NFL make some plays and show that this Colts defense has depth and they can get it done no matter who's in the game. 
We will he hear from head coach Frank Reich around 145 today. He will give the official injury report looking ahead to Sunday. So watch for that. Also one note, as you mentioned, Rock Yassine and of course the curiosity about the availability of Xavier Rhodes is X has been out there on the practice field watching. So although he hasn't been on the field right. in the mix, he's been standing on the sidelines coaching up guys like Rock Yassine, getting that immediate feedback to him so that Rock can continue to develop. And we know that that connection yeah. between those two was something that started last year's off season. So it's great for Rock as a young corner to have that mentorship of a guy like Xavier Rhodes. John is asking, what is Eric Fisher's status? We did see Fisher on the practice field Wednesday and Thursday. Very encouraging progress from him. We will see how much he's involved in terms of getting into potentially the team portion today. From what I've seen so far, we didn't see him really do much in team. It was more of the individual work so far. But when I spoke with Frank Reich on Tuesday of this week, he said that the progress in terms of rehabbing the Achilles was way ahead of schedule. It was really just testing the conditioning and that mm -hmm. they would fast track it as much as possible. And a guy who is one, of Eric Fisher's stature and to as veteran as Eric Fisher is, he knows how to, you know, maybe make some extra leaps if he needs to, right. to get up to speed, no, that's a good point. you know, quicker than what you would necessarily see for the recovery of that type of injury and getting back into true football playing shape. It's one thing to get out there on the practice field. Right. It's another to play, you know, 100% speed. Looking at a few more questions coming in. This is a guy who was very intriguing over the course of the offseason. Michael Strawn, some questions on Big Mike. Terry asks, do you think we'll see Michael Strawn in the starting lineup this week? We've seen a healthy rotation of him so far, not only those preseason games, but in practices. Yeah, I mean, starting lineup, I really don't think, not to downplay that, but I really just don't think it matters because, as you said, the word that you hit right on the head is rotation. The Colts will rotate a lot of their wide receivers, and – you know, he is probably with T.Y. Hilton's absence going on IR, missing these three games. He's probably bumped up to that fourth wide receiver role on the depth chart, and he's got to play. He, he has to play. And so, you know, he may not be out there for 60 to 70 percent of the offensive snaps, but I tell you what, Larry, he probably will play 20 to 30 percent and get a couple of targets, meaning he's got to come up big for this team. And not that I was surprised by Mike Strawn in the preseason mm -hmm. because I know the Colts had a lot of confidence in this guy. I guess I was just not expecting to be this impressed by him this early well, coming from a Division II school in the seventh round and a native of the Bahamas. And hadn't played football in two years because his, he lost his entire senior season yep. because of the pandemic when it was pushed off and then canceled. So you're talking about a guy who truly hadn't stepped on a football field in a Division II capacity, let alone walking in and being a guy who was making plays, right. you know, in, in, the, in the NFL preseason. Absolutely. I mean, he, he is the big body receiver that the Colts have been sort of looking Trending for. Toward, yeah. You know, they, they had, um, they had uh, a couple years ago, they, they experimented that with Devin Funches, and he tore or broke his clavicle in week one in 2019 with, against the Los Angeles Chargers. And drafting Michael Pittman, Pittman's a little bit of a do-it-all guy. He's mm -hmm. got speed. He can go up and get those 50-50 uh, balls and win on the outside, put him in the boundary, and, and win a one-on-one -on -one matchup with a, uh, a slant or a go route. I think Michael Pittman can do all of those things, but is maybe a little bit more of a bigger play uh, receiver a guy that has great speed. He's certainly going to be big inside the red zone. And again, I, I think this is not too big for Michael Strawn. I mean, coming from a Division II school, as you said, hasn't played football in two years. I thought we were going to see a lot more speed bumps in training camp than we saw. He still had his moments, right, where he would run, run the wrong route or, or drop a contested pass. But, you know, those moments have been few and far between. And in between all of that has been a lot of spectacular plays. And a guy that looks like he's been in the NFL for five years in terms of his uh, football intelligence, his intellect, his route running, and just how smooth he looks out there. I know I was a big fan of the old Mike and Mike show, you know, Golick and Greenberg. This is the new Mike and Mike show when you got Pittman and Pittman Strawn. And Strawn. Pittman and Strawn out there. And one thing we know too, Strawn was among that group of receivers that went to work this summer in Texas with Carson Wentz. And he spent immense time down there with his new quarterback, mm -hmm. making sure that they created that type of chemistry that they were going to need. So I'm going to get now to a question on Carson Wentz. This is from Lance. He said, should we expect, should we actually, sorry, there we go. Uh, should we expect more of a run game or a pass game with Carson Wentz under center with the first game? 
Man, great question. And it all boils down to game plan, right? And I think one of the things that, that will factor into that is what, what do we expect from Seattle's defense? What kind of defense are we going to get? And the reason why I'm saying that is last year they were Jekyll and Hyde for half the season, right? To begin this season, they were awful. I mean, they, they gave up a ton of yards and a lot of points. They averaged giving up over 350 passing yards per game in the first eight games of the season, which is historically on track at that point, one of the worst defenses of all time. They gave up over 30 points per game in that stretch, but Lara, they turned it around somehow, some way. In the last eight games of the season, they gave up only 16 points per game, which was the best mark in the NFL. And so Jamal Adams came off of injury. I think that helped. And uh, I think the competition lightened up a little bit for them down the stretch. But regardless, you know, you're talking about a defense that was able to you know, put it together and, and really slow down some pretty good teams heading into the playoffs as they won, you know, 12 games last year and uh, won their division for the first time since 2016. So up front, they're a really good team. Um, they've got a lot of playmakers back from last year's team, including a guy in the front seven and Bobby Wagner, who leads the universe in tackles since 2012. He's got over 1,200 tackles in that time span. Uh, but they you were, better believe Darius Leonard has that like posted oh yeah. somewhere as motivation, right? Like D Leonard knows that going in, although they won't be on the field together. That's a point of contention, right? right. To have that pride out there, a guy who is so regarded sure. in something that Darius Leonard wants to be dominant. Well, in. Seattle, again, stopped the run very well last year, but it's one of those things where the Colts, that's their strength. And they want to establish the line of scrimmage early in the game, no matter who they're playing and no matter how stat uh, their opposing defense is. So uh, I, I think it's going to be established the, the line of scrimmage early. But that being said, the Colts are not a team under Frank Reich that's going to bang their head against the wall if something isn't working. They're going to take what the defense is giving them. And with Carson Wentz coming out here and making his first uh, or his, you know, his, his Colts debut mm -hmm. playing at Lucas Oil Stadium for the first time, I know he wants to get off to a good, efficient start, control his emotions, try to keep the game within himself, so to speak. Um, but I think you're going to see a good mixture of both, especially early on if, if at the line of scrimmage is not working for guys like Jonathan Taylor or Jordan Wilkins or Naeem Hines running the football um, to begin the game for the Colts. Let's go on the outside and let's see what we can get with Pittman and, and Campbell and obviously, you know, some of the guys on the outside with Zach Pascal and Mike Strawn, who we already talked about. So I think it's going to be a good mixture of both. Regardless, you know, the Colts were a team last year that scored on 44% of their drives. Really good efficiency with Phillip Rivers. I think that carries over here with Carson Wentz. And when you're talking about the pass catchers for the Indianapolis Colts, throw Kylan Granson in there as well. We talked about the rookie Mike Strawn. Certainly Kylan Granson, the fourth round pick, one of those who expect to do some big things early on. The Colts looking to do something they have not done since 2013, and that is win the season opener. A few questions on the offense we'll get through quickly, and then certainly I know a lot of people are excited about this defense. I am so excited to see this defense. Terry wants to know, can we expect to see Big Q in week one? He was limited in practice. We will see what his status is today moving forward, but I will say if Quentin Nelson misses a game, he would have to be like physically restrained, I think, to do so. Because I think he'd have to be on Mars or something. Absolutely. Right? Like I, it would it would take something of a very of a great magnitude to keep Big Q from getting out there. Joshua asks who will play left tackle. We should hear from Frank Reich right around 145 with an update on that. If it is not Eric Fisher, if he has not yet had enough time to get up to speed, you would expect it would be Julian Davenport, who had really a solid latter half of the preseason. OK, right. defensively, I want to go to a question that we had here. Scrolling back to Joshua, how will the Colts pass rushers prevent Russell Wilson from extending plays to open up the deep ball? Before we get into your answer, this is something I asked Frank Reich about. And he was saying that to some degree, Russell's going to make some plays. Like you just know, it's just limiting the big plays as much as you possibly can. Not killing yourself when you do give up a play, just being able to quickly reset and adjust what you need to do moving forward. So it's not so much that you, you, you know that there is a degree of a guy who is as good as Russell Wilson is, that he is going to make plays that is inevitable, but you just don't want too many of those to occur. You think about the situation last year with Green Bay Packers and Aaron Rodgers and what the Indianapolis Colts sure. defense was able to do then, see it being somewhat similar. Sure, I mean, when you face a guy like Russell Wilson, the pass rush is so big, and the biggest thing is fundamental lane integrity. You cannot let him have lanes to the outside 
or up the middle. And that's why it's so big for the pass rush on the outside and the push up the middle from guys like Grover Stewart and DeForest Buckner to be in sync, to be in harmony. Because when you have nowhere to go, when the pass rush on the outside gets home and a quarterback like that has to step up into the pocket, he should be greeted very unpleasantly by a guy like DeForest Buckner who led the Colts last year in sacks with nine and a half. And oh, by the way, set a franchise record for sacks by a defensive tackle. So it's all about fundamentals and lane integrity. When you get this guy on the outside, a guy like Russell Wilson, that's when backyard football, that's when the big plays down the field to DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett can absolutely kill you, right? And it doesn't have, to your point, it's not like it, it's going to happen all game long, but if it happens two or three times and they get big chunk plays to set up field goals or scoring drives, that's enough for them to change the game and potentially win the game, right? So every play matters. You have to be disciplined up front in order to prevent that. Again, 60, 65 times per game uh, when Seattle's on, on offense. But I'm really intrigued to see how this goes up front to begin the season for the Colts defense because as we know Lara no Justin Houston and no Danico Autry mm -hmm. the Colts in the offseason are pretty much they're betting on themselves they're betting on the talent that they have up front with guys like Al Quadim Mohammed and drafting Quiddy Pay and eventually getting Dio Adengbo in the lineup I think in the long term they're really really going to be set with those two guys who were drafted in the second round and first round respectively but Let's go Al Quadim Mohammed. Let's go Ben Banigou. Let's go Kamoko Toure. It's all hands on deck, and it's not necessarily about the number of sacks. How many times you get home on Russell Wilson? Uh, you know, when we look at the box score on, on on Monday, hopefully we're not looking at you know. Uh, we only have two or three sacks. It's really not about the sacks. It's about the game-changing pressures and disrupting things uh, in the backfield, whether that's hurrying or throw or you know, forcing uh, Russell Wilson to slide in the pocket the last minute and be off kilter a little bit with his footwork in the pocket and, and air, mail, air, air mail a throw or put one in the dirt. It's those types of plays where we go back and watch the film on Monday that are going to impact the game for the Colts on defense, not necessarily the box score and all the crooked numbers we see in tackles for loss or sacks you want to see the guys on the outside impacting and, and helping the other guys on the inside or those linebackers create more plays and get some stops on third down and get Seattle off the field to your point too on the Seattle offense is this is a team that you don't want to be playing catch up against you know it's going to be imperative for the Colts offense to get off to a strong start to not sputter in the red zone you know capitalize on those opportunities not settling for field goals and all of that those are going to be things that you're really going to want to rely upon because if you let Seattle get out to you know a double digit lead early Absolutely. on you know they're playing with house money so to speak. Oh that's scenario. that's a great point I mean Seattle's coming off a season where they scored over 30 points per game in eight games average 28 for the season and they set a franchise record for points scored in a season last year and Russell Wilson I mean he is I feel like he's been in the NFL as long as Peyton Manning. That's how it feels, but it's only been since 2012. And uh, this is one of the all-time great winners. He leads the NFL in, in league history for wins by a quarterback in their first nine seasons. So he's a winner. He's a playmaker. And also what they're really good at doing is adjusting the game plan in the second half to beat you. They are 64-2 and two at halftime under Pete Carroll when they're up by at least four points at halftime. So that is a really big thing um, heading into this game is not to get down early, but to also make sure that Seattle can't change the game plan or shorten the game on you in the second half. And mentioning changing the game plan, they do have a new offensive coordinator, although you talk about all of the returners, they have new offensive coordinator for the Seahawks. It'll mm -hmm. be interesting, interesting to see what wrinkles he brings in. Okay, a couple more and then we will wrap things up because we got to get out to practice. Rudy says, do you see Pay as a pure pass rusher or does he shine against the run as well. He's do it all. He's yeah. do it all. He has speed to power, but they've really focused on his speed this training camp. He's really good against the run and he's smart. IQ is just oh. off the charts with with Quiddy Pay and he's adding things to his arsenal. And he's taking mental notes throughout camp in the preseason. Um, to the point where his arsenal is, is filled up like a guy that's been in the league for two or three years. And that's a really rare thing, according to his uh, position coach, Brian Baker. He's able to process things and, and categorize things based on who he's going up against and their tendencies. That's something I talked to Quiddy about after the game at Detroit. He said he was really learning to rely on himself 
rely on his instinct mm -hmm. much more than even he did at the University of Mich Michigan because of how much confidence that Brian Baker has instilled in him. And he felt like he was only scratching the surface with that. Quickly, I want to note, I don't know that I've been more impressed by a draft, cl draft class than this one right here, just in the amount of time, which we've, of course, had the time in training camp, which we didn't have last year. But the maturity, the poise, the presence of this draft class has been incredibly impressive across the board. I mean, it is, these are guys who come in with this veteran type of, of presence, and they are walking in not as developmental type of guys. These are guys who are expected and called upon to be playmakers, to be difference makers now. These are not talking about we're hitting our midseason form, the, right. you know, like come weeks five, six, seven, eight. These are week one, week two, week three type of talents. No, without question. I mean, the NFL is not a developmental league. Yeah. Okay. You have to come in and you have to produce. And I think the Colts are going to rely on a lot of guys in that draft class, to your point, to be big playmakers right out of the gate this season. Quiddy Pay, obviously, it goes without saying, but Kylan Granson in the fourth round. Okay. This is a day three draft pick that I think is capable of getting. 600 receiving yards and a couple of touchdowns this year and playing a big role like we saw in years past in this offense like Eric Ebron or Trey Burton last mm -hmm. year. Okay, so these are not just, you know, roster bodies or, mm -hmm. or guys that you think they, they can be good players for you in 2022 or 2023. I mean, we've already talked about Mike Strawn. Will Fries made the team. He's the swing tackle. Inevitably, he's going to be called upon to do something um, this season because injuries up front are just, again, they're inevitable. So uh, th this is a very impactful draft class and, and, and good work by Chris Ballard and his staff by bringing in guys that can play right out of the gate so that when you lose guys in free agency or when contracts are up, you replenish the roster with impactful talent. So if you're going down to Lucas Oil Stadium, a reminder, Touchdown Town is open on Sunday. And if you're looking for something to do tonight, I will be at the kickoff concert at um, at Monument Circle, myself and Jeffrey Gorman. It's been so long since I've been down there. It took me a second to remember Monument Circle. What's it called again? <laughs> exactly. And a big thing in the middle of downtown. The statue so, in the middle. Yes. So Jeffrey Gorman and I will be down there. We have Parmalee. We have Clayton Anderson. Roads Below. All of the different bands that will be performing. But when I mentioned game day, tell the people if they're not going to be down there, how they can listen, how they can join us in our sure. coverage as well. Because I know a lot of people you know, want to know about the app and the fan and sure. how they can do all of that. No longer having that AM um, option. So. Yeah, in Indianapolis, flagship stations 93.5, 107.5, The Fan, also 97.1, Hank FM in Indianapolis. If you're out of the market, head to Colts.com uh, and search for the radio affiliates for a radio station in your area. If you're somewhere else in the state of Indiana or in Illinois or Kentucky, we've got you covered there. And then app-wise or streaming-wise, um, you can listen to the Colts broadcast on the Colts app. If you're in Indianapolis or in the Indianapolis area, you can listen to the broadcast anywhere on Colts.com on laptop. I know that's kind of confusing, but laptop anywhere uh, at just in Indianapolis. And then streaming, it's on Sirius XM channel 813. If you're a Sirius XM subscriber or if you have NFL Game Pass, you can get it on there as well. See, that's why he needs so many notes because he has so much information over there. The birthday boy, the voice of the Colts, Matt Taylor, touchdown INDY. You're going to hear it on Sunday. We are so excited to be back. So excited to see so many of you on Sunday at Lucas Oil Stadium as this team begins the climb in 2021.